a strange silence. Can you hear me? Right, I think we're ready to go. Ready to go, Mrs. Hall? Yeah, ready to go. Excellent, right. Good morning, Habs girls. Thank you very much for leaving your beds to join us this morning. I'm going to pass you over to Mrs. Saunders, who's going to introduce uh, this morning's introduction, an introduction to an introduction, and then we'll get started with the day. Mrs. Saunders, over to you. Welcome everybody. Um, today we will be focusing on the important and very topical issue of sustainability. This is a subject that I know many of you feel very strongly about and about which some of you in the middle school researched and wrote about as part of the middle school essay prize earlier this year. Hopefully you are all inspired by the excellent talks on Monday to think more about the changes that you can make as individuals to your own communities as well as to society in broader terms. We are very excited about the different talks and tasks that you'll be taking part in today. We hope that you will use this opportunity to think big and we look forward to seeing what you come up with. This morning we begin with Dan Epstein and Sophie Thomas from Useful Projects, a company that consults on sustainability issues. Dan is the Consultant Director of Sustainability and founder of Useful Projects and he led the Sustainable Development and Regeneration team for the London Olympics in 2012, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about in a minute. Sophie is the Director of Design at Useful Projects and a keen promoter of sustainability through education and business. She'll be talking to you about the role of design and the practical application of sustainability. There will be some time after Dan and Sophie introduce themselves for a quick Q&A session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to you all, Dan Epstein and Sophie Thomas from Useful Projects. Hello. Hi. Uh, I think I'm going first, aren't I? OK, great. So uh, I'm Sophie. I'm going to share my screen with you because I've got a few slides. Um, here we go. Hopefully you can see this. It's coming in a minute. So yes, as I said, my name's Sophie. Um, I'm actually trained as a designer and I run a design studio and I have for the last 22 years. And um, I started to, I, I didn't start looking specifically at sustainability, although I've always been really interested, interested in environmental issues and really worried about the state of the work, the earth and kind of concerned about what we were doing but when I started looking in my particular field in uh, product and graphic design I realized that actually I was probably part of the problem as well and actually the things that I was making the things that were being created by my designs were sort of ending up being sort of found in waste streams and causing pollution and I thought this isn't very good and so I've spent a few years, quite a lot of years, talking to people about how we should be really redesigning things better. So this was a picture that someone drew of me about my thought process. Like I was actually brushing my teeth in the morning and I was thinking, I wonder actually what happens to my toothbrush when I finish? Because, you know, I get through, uh, as, as our dentist tells us, we get through, uh, we should change our toothbrush every four months. Uh, that means that uh, I have to throw away four toothbrushes every year or yeah about that and then so uh, what happens to them and actually I started to look at that toothbrush and realized that it was not made of just one material so I couldn't put it in a recycling bin it was actually made of four different types of plastic it had metal bits in the head and I thought this is ridiculous you know such a small piece of equipment that we all use hopefully I hope you've all you brushed your teeth this morning um, actually ends up in a bin which it ends up floating in the ocean which you know we've seen a lot of recently so this picture was actually done in 2009 um, before even David Attenborough was talking about this on the TV so it's brilliant now that we're actually having a bit of a heads up on all of this stuff. So um, I'm quite an unusual designer I spend a lot of time looking in waste streams of our products um, I'm a, um, for that I've been given a chartered uh, 
I'm a chartered waste manager, so I'm allowed to go into landfill sites. And I also have done training on the bins around Chelsea, which is very exciting and very smelly. And you do have to get up incredibly early in the morning. Just looking actually at how we collect our waste and what our products and why things end up as waste, as I said. Um, one of the things that's a big mantra for me is actually sustainability is about keeping things in the loop. So uh, regenerative, you know, all the words around sustainability about renewal, recycling, regenerative, it's very much about things keeping going. We reuse them, we get the most life out of things. Uh, we put life back into our cities, we green up our spaces, but it's also about the stuff we use around us. And actually when we talk about climate emergency and the issues that are coming up in the last year and all the climate strikes, a lot of it, a lot of our embodied energy and our footprint is actually in the stuff that we use. It's nearly half, actually. And that's to do with all the material that goes into all of our stuff as well. So this is my mantra. I keep reminding myself every day that actually I need to uh, design things better because that's where it all comes from. So what are we looking at? Uh, we know that there's some terrible statistics about plastic waste. We have um, a truckload of plastic so like a whole one of those whole big uh, rubbish trucks going into the sea every minute currently. We're looking at that increasing to about four trucks a minute by 2050. And by 2050 also, they say that there'll be more there'll be more plastic uh, than fin fish in the ocean in volume. So that's an incredible amount of plastic going in. And this is a collection of plastic that I pulled up of uh, the Pacific garbage patch in Hawaii and brought back. Other things like our clothing. So in average in the UK, we only get seven wears of plus seven wears of of uh, use out of our clothing, uh, which is a ridiculously low amount of wears out of clothes. And we have a massive stream of textile waste going through the going through the UK at the moment. Also, in terms of what goes into our stuff, so um, a half a litre bottle of Coke to make a half a litre bottle of Coke, we have uh, the, it uses 175 litres of water to make it. So that's in the growing, the manufacturing and the distribution. Um, so we also really have to understand what goes into our things in the first place to understand what we need to get out and to look at the regenerative and the recycling and the recovery of all our materials as well. We also have something called the critical elements list. So this is a list which is held at Europe um, and which talks about the periodic table and all the different elements. And these are the kind of the building blocks of all the raw materials that I use in my products on a daily basis that I build my designs from. And there are currently 27 elements on this list, which are kind of at critical stages where we can't get enough out of the earth in a way that's that's um, manageable without putting massive strain on the earth, but for the demand that we have. So we have an increased amount of demand going on in terms of our high tech technologies. We have a lot of renewable energy, for instance, which needs all these new elements. We have wind turbines, we have P uh, photovoltaics and all of these uh, these products need to have elements. And what's happening is that we have a huge amount of elements that are being lost in uh, these products that are going to the waste streams very quickly and they're very difficult to get out. So the design process that I look at is about how we can design things where we can recover all, a lot of these materials and elements. And um, I wanted to show you this, this slide, which was done by a friend of mine who was at that point part of the Chemistry uh, Knowledge Transfer Network, and this was done in 2008. And he was talking about what our periodic table would look, may look like in 10 years time. And if you imagine that was like just past now, and it was talking about what happens if we're going along in terms of like business as usual and we keep using these materials and not recovering them back. So first of all, he talked about the kind of radioactive decay of all the ones that are very have a very fast half life. And then he said, well, OK, if we carry on business as usual, actually, this is what it's going to look like. So all of those black crosses and those red crosses are basically the ones that will be disappearing. So or not just disappearing, because we know actually the Earth, you know, if it, in the laws of physics, things don't just disappear, but it's to do with like impossibility to get out because they're scattered in waste electronic streams or in our products, in our packaging, in our in our kind of cars, in our, all the kind of what the landfills and the, 
areas like that around the world. So you can see there things like nickel, copper, zinc, gallium. I mean, gallium is a really important uh, material for semiconductors. We have indium, one of the really most important materials for making photovoltaics. We have gold, platinum. Um, all of these materials are incredibly important for design and for sustainable living. You know, if we can't have, if we don't have any indium left, we won't be able to make photovoltaics in the way that we make them now. So it's really important when you think about sustainability to really think about the other side of it, the products and what goes into our stuff in order to make sure that it's not just about recycling. It's about actually being very conscious, conscious of uh, the the materials around us that help us get to where we want to get to if we're looking at a green recovery if we're looking at build back better etc so one of the things is about you know that i look at particularly is about how spending behavior and behavior change which is incredibly important again for sustainability and how we can really change people for the better change ourselves for the better so it's a positive issue that we don't just think about what we're consuming all the time to make impressions on people that we don't really care about in the end. And this is a great quote from a design guru called Victor Papanek. If you're interested, look him up. Um, and finally, so some of the work that I did was very much around how to do that. And I work specifically in an area called the circular economy. And some of you may have heard about that, but it's effectively looking at an economic system which which uses design to really help value and our products and the value in our stuff and our materials and our raw materials and our resources to stay in the economy, to stay in the loop for as long as possible. And so it's about designing in different ways. So we talk about designing for longevity, which is very much about fixing things, um, durability. So upgrades on your phones, for instance, um, being able to change bits and things, you know, being able to fix your own washing machine, perhaps your own car. Um, we talk about leasing or services, so now you can see a lot of uh, different products which which you can get through the post. So, for instance, uh, you can now buy uh, laundry liquid through the post. You can buy uh, shaving equipment through the post. All these things, these are different kinds of models where uh, you could potentially send something back as well. So a lot of things now you can send your packaging back to the manufacturer. Um, we talk about design and reuse. So how could you design a product which actually could be taken back to the manufacturer, taken apart, so disassembled, put back together again and then resold to someone else? Why does it have to end up in, in a landfill site? And then we also talk about design for material recovery. So this is very much about like speed of recycling very, very quickly. Um, and a lot of the work that I did was with UK government and with, <coughs> excuse me, the RSA. So in London, which is um, looking at the encouragement of arts and manufacturing commerce. And we built this kind of system of uh, getting people interested. And um, there are loads and loads of videos on this site to show you what we did. So we took things apart, we looked at them, and then we put them back together and we redesigned them in a better way. And we talk a lot about that. So this is the great recovery site, which I worked on. And um, I think that's me. So I'm going to stop 10 minutes in. And I'm going to stop sharing. OK, thank you, Sophie. Uh, Dan, are you ready? I am. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. If you not could yet. just screen share them up. Yep, sorry. Here we go. Let me see if I can. We yeah, there? I've got them. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say thanks to Megan, Kate, Anna, um, Ed, with Anne Simon um, for inviting us. This is probably one of the most scary uh, presentations I've had to give. I mean, I give them to government, but it's far more difficult to give them to um, to, to uh, young people. Um, I'm going to talk. I have a very different sort of background in a way. I'm a kind of engineer and a forester, um, and I've spent the last 30 years. I sound so old, Jesus. Um, I spent the last 30 years working in sustainable development. In fact, I was sort of looking at climate change in 1986, 80, um, 85. Um, and I, in fact, I spent the first seven years of my working life in the Himalayas in Nepal, fixing landslides and working with local communities. 
um, looking at working on big engineering projects to try to understand how we could deliver better um, in engineering projects that also improve the environment. It was really challenging. The, the problems that I studied when I was um, at university in sort of the, the, the early 1980s are exactly the same problems that we face today, and you'll all be familiar with them. So I'm looking at issues around climate change and carbon emissions and our energy use, um, which, as most of you know, you know, result in, have resulted in really strange weather conditions. You know, if you think about this year, we've had the wettest February on record in the UK. We've all forgotten that because of COVID. We've also had the driest May, which we've all really enjoyed uh, because we've all been at home. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a garden sat in your garden or sat in a heaving park. Um, but it's really strange. And, and people are now predicting that we're going to have 40 degrees, which is a sort of desert type environment in the UK in the next two or three years. So the, the climate, and that's never happened before. So the climate is changing. This slide just shows you in February, on the 28th of February, 2018, we had the coldest uh, day on record in the UK. One year later, on the 25th of February, 2019, we had the hottest ever February on record. So it's quite extraordinary what's happening. So that's the first big issue I deal with is sort of climate change both in terms of carbon emissions, but also in terms of resilience. The second big issue I look at when I'm designing and working with cities and big projects is mass extinction of species. We're destroying our environment in all sorts of ways, um, whether it's to do with plastics in the ocean and animals getting caught up, the destruction of rainforest, the bleaching of, um, the bleaching of coral reefs, etc. They're all the same problem. They're to do with the way in which we're living on our planet and we're destroying the ecosystem. And what's so alarming about this, apart from losing more species more rapidly than we've ever lost, is that we're also um, undermining our own life support system because the planet is a life support system. Um, Sophie's talked about resources and resource recovery. We use more resources now than we've ever used. And, and the amount of resources we use is just growing exponentially. Um, but the other issue that I, I deal with, I got more and more interested in, is cities. So this was, there were in, in the 19, in 1950, there were six major cities around the world. Um, and that was it. There was London, New York, Paris, Moscow, Shanghai, and Tokyo. By 2015, there were over 30 cities, many of which had more than 20 million people in them. This is an extraordinary sort of change. You know, when I started um, my work, 75% um, of the world's population, and there were only about 4 billion people on the planet, lived in cities. Today, more than 50% of people live in cities, and there's 7.8 billion of us all consuming. So here's a picture of Shanghai, and I went there in, 19, um, in, in, sorry, in uh, 1998. And I went back again during the Olympics uh, in Tokyo, I went to Shanghai, and this is how it had changed in 20 years. So it went from this to this, you know, that's what's happening in 20 years. It gives you a real understanding of how cities are changing. So those problems that we have to face around climate and resources and mass extinction are largely related to city growth. So we've got to design our cities to deal with that. Now, that's not a new problem, you know, going right back to 1858. This was the River Thames. It was a river of sewage and we didn't understand that sewage was bad for us. We thought that cholera, for example, was caused by air pollution. And we now know it's water and a, a, a very interesting epidemiologist. You know, we know that COVID now, the many, many epidemiologists are now working on COVID. Well, a really early epidemiologist called John Snow discovered that it was the water um, that was polluted in our wells that was killing people. And so we had, as a result of that, um, in, nine, in um, 18, I think it was 1862, 1863, the first municipal water authority was created by the House of Parliament. Um, and they built this extraordinary sewer, which wasn't just a sewer, it's also, we, in fact, we built this new embankment, this new big wall along the River Thames. We claimed land along the River Thames and we put a sewer in there which still serves London, so that's over 100 years old. It also had the first metro line, the underground, the first underground tube line, and it had, and we created this fantastic park, 
from that. So we know that from history, we can use engineering and our ingenuity to solve really big problems. And this sewer probably saved more people in London than any other, any medical intervention in our history. Similarly, in 18, the 1890s, the people of London were really worried because there were 500,000 horses pulling carts around. That's how we got around in, in the city in 1890. And they thought that we were all going to be buried in um, horse manure. Um, so there was this prediction that within 15 years, each horse uh, produces 15 kilos of manure a day and two litres of urine, so pee, and that we were going to drown within 15 years in London of horse manure. Well, well, you know what happened? We invented the tram and the car. And that was an amazing thing at the time, you know, Henry Ford and these trams. And every city had trams and cars began to kind of get really popular. But then in the 1950s, we took all those trams out of cities and we just let the cars rip large. So many, many, many more people uh, started buying cars. And what happens when you have too much of a good thing? We just end up with huge pollution, big traffic jams. And now the biggest problem that we face in the city is air pollution and air quality. You know, we're literally kind of walking around and um, giving ourselves asthma and all sorts of lung diseases because we're sitting, you know, we're walking about in these massive traffic jams. So now we, ne we need to reinvent a new way of moving about. And it's really interesting in Seoul, this is one of my favorite uh, project, uh, I, uh, projects. I went to Seoul in, in 1998 and there was this huge road which has 12 lanes that led into the middle of uh, the city, uh, into the middle of uh, Seoul in South Korea. And at, underneath the carriageway here is an old river which had been buried. So the mayor of Seoul said, this is crazy. This is just one, we had to stop all of this. And so they took out all of those roads and they built this and they, re, they uncovered the river and they built this amazing park. The air temperature went down by six degrees and the quality of the air went up. And what's happened as a result is 60,000 people every day now use this amazing park. So that's the ability of you know, human kind, ingenuity of engineering, to rethink our city um, and to build very different ways of moving around, but also to turn to uh, and beginning to understand the importance of green space. And I think that most of us recognise that over during COVID, that we really we really um, love parks and green spaces, and they're incredibly important for our sanity and for our physical health. And we know of things like obesity are really important. So we need to reimagine the way we design our cities in terms of sustainability, in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of green space, in terms of water use, in terms of um, environmental, in terms of health, in terms of um, resource utilization, in terms of longevity, in terms of community, in terms of uh, fairness for everybody. And so here, this was the Olympic Park. I, as, um, as Anna said, I was the head of sustainable development for the Olympic Park. So I, my job was really to think about how we can make the Olympics the greenest games ever. Um, this was what the landscape looked like in 2005. It was a dumping ground. We had the biggest landfill um, in, in any city in Europe on the Olympic Park. We had old industries. We had pollution everywhere. The land was contaminated. And so I spent a year, uh, five years working with all sorts of brilliant people thinking about everything from water reclamation to landscape, land reclamation to how we deal with soils to how we reuse materials. Um, and so here's one example. I'm, I've only got time to give you one example, but we took these old pipes which were used in a gas mains um, and hadn't, well, had been used in, um, they were surplus from a, a big gas mains project. And we ended up reusing those in the Olympic, uh, on the Olympic Stadium. So those old gas mains, gas pipes, form the ring beam for the Olympic Stadium. And we did lots of interesting stuff like that, which people told us we couldn't do just by using creativity and engineering and design skills to reimagine how we could build using secondhand materials. So 20% of all the materials on the Olympic Park were, came from secondhand or reused sources that had never been done before. I mean, I could go on and on about the Olympics and different things we did and we maybe in the question and answer we can talk about it, but we really set lots of new precedents. So in the end, I think sustainable development 
is all about doing good development. It's that sort of simple. It's how do we make our cities really work for people and for the environment? How do we, and we need to, if we're going to do that well, we need to start balancing things like design and carbon and environmental impact and access and um, diversity and waste, et cetera, and water use and combine really clever thinking into the way in which we rethink design. So thanks very much. That's the end of my slideshow. Maybe you can hand over. OK, so um, if we could just have a, a little bit of a Q&A session um, now, we actually have some um, questions that were emailed in to us um, in advance um, and some that have um, have been posted as well uh, now. So uh, we'll see how many of these we have time uh, to get through. Um, the first question that we'd like to pose is um, about the Olympics. What was the most difficult aspect of the Olympics project and what advice would you give to Tokyo for their future sustainable Olympics? So the most difficult thing I think was that Brit, you know, when you win the Olymp when you compete for the Olympics, many cities want to host the Olympics. Um, you you do everything you can to win the Olympics, and so when at, at the very last minute, London thought that Paris was going to win the Olympics, and so when we went to Singapore to submit our application, our bid, and to present it um, on the plane going over there. The Mayor of London, Ken Livingstone and Sebastian Coe and Tessa Jowell, who was the Minister for the Olympics and, and other amazing people who went over to present, said, what can we do that's really different? And they said, oh, let's make it the most sustainable Olympics ever. And they had no idea what that meant. And so when we won it, which they were all shocked about, they came back and they said, um, we need to make this the most sustainable Olympics. And, they, and I was asked to sort of work out what that meant. So the most difficult thing actually was to work out what does a sustainable Olympics actually mean? And then the second most difficult thing was that I said, so I, I work with some really clever, really interesting people, lots of engineers. I mean, there were about 500 of us working on this, but I just kind of coordinated it. But we had lots of fantastic ideas from brilliant companies, design companies, architectural companies, um, engineering companies, and we had to pull all that together but then I had to go back to the minister and to all these great people and say, um, we can be the most sustainable Olympics, but we have to spend 75p and every pound that we spend on the Olympics has to go into things that are going to last for a very long time. And so the really difficult thing was designing the Olympics, not for 30 days, you know, for the Paralympics and the Olympics, but to last for 100 years. So if you go there now, you'll see that the Olympic Village was designed to house 17,000 athletes and the teams, but it then to be turned into flats that people could live in. The Olympic Park, we turned into an amazing park which people still visit and it's, it's really successful. We had to make, to turn the swimming pool into a swimming pool that, was, could, ho that could house 17,000 people during the Olympics, but only 2,000 people afterwards because you never need to host 17,000 people. So we had to design buildings that could be converted into smaller buildings afterwards. So it was really, really tested our our thinking. And it was really the principles that, that Sophie talked about, longevity, different ways of buying things, building things that could be reused and recycled, you know, really rethinking design, which was really challenging. Lovely answer. I'm absolutely fascinated by the Olympics. My sister lives in those um, one of those flats now, so we visit a lot and seeing how it changes and how it's being reused. is such a wonderful thing for our community. And we've got another question here from Lower Four. How does England compare with other countries in terms of how we use our sustainability? And what do you think our government should be doing more of, given the urgency of the climate crisis? Oh, that's a really a really another really tough question um, that we did. I mean, I work a lot with government as well, but from a kind of resources materials perspective. And um, there was last a couple of years ago, there was a really good paper that came out called the uh, Waste and Resources Strategy 
um, which actually had so many things set out in it, which, which were really, really inspiring, um, all the way from looking at deposit return schemes for packaging through to construction, through to uh, kind of looking at the uh, natural capital. So making sure that our land is sort of factored into the way that we do things. Um, and I think we're still waiting for the environment bill to come in. So there are things in play, but actually what's happening is everything's kind of on hold. Um, in terms of the areas that I look into, in, uh, the UK actually was leading on, in things like plastic waste and, and packaging as well, because we had this kind of the blue planet effect, as it's known uh, in, in my world. So um, actually in terms of action and campaigning, so not necessarily from the government perspective, but the fact that actually as a population, we were very aware of it and we were actually leading the global movement of redu uh, reducing single use packaging. Now, what's really important for me is that we don't lose that momentum you know we're really we're all stuck at home actually our packaging and our use of materials like that has is increasing and people are sort of moving away from single use bans so my call out for all of you guys is to keep the pressure on and uh, keep pushing the government to actually really to to put forward that environment bill because we have to make those changes so um what i would say is that scandinavia is much better and Germany actually than we are. I think we're much better at talking about sustainability and about climate, but I think we're quite slow at acting. Um, and I think many of us got really excited with all the children's marches that something might actually change. I think people began to really sort of see how important climate is. And I think it's the same with Black Lives Matter. I think it's it, things only change when people get radical, when kids get radical, when when we all get radical, when grandparents get radical, etc. Because um, that's what government responds to. I think our government is really quite slow and doesn't take this seriously enough. I think our our uh, professional people, our engineers, our architects, our planners, etc. Some of the best in the world and we export. We go out, we work all over the world and do help other countries do really interesting stuff, build much greener homes. We're just quite slow in the in Britain. I think we really understand the problem. I think we need to really pre push up the pressure. And I think one of the disappointing things is that we've almost forgotten about all the climate marches, you know, with COVID. What COVID has shown us, though, is how important clean air, green space, uh, social equity, uh, giving access to everybody to good environments, overheating, etc., have not gone away. They become more important. We're about to watch what Boris and the Treasury do now. We're about to reinvest in our economy more than we've ever invested. Let's see if we invest in a green economy or we go back to the old fossil fuel economies and just continue as business as usual. So that's, I would say, watch out for that. Keep an eye on it. Keep a record and get out marching. And maybe I'm not allowed to say that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but also like actually it's not just about the marching it's the action it's the kind of like what do you do where do you go with your career what do you want to do and actually both Dan and I work in areas where we we are privileged to be able to use our skills that we've learned in our careers to actually try and make change and I think it's 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 going to become so important for all of you to really understand that actually you can have a place of influence in this and actually you can take your your emotional connection with what you want to do, like how you live. So if you if you feel very strongly about wanting to save the planet, you can take that into your career. You don't have to separate them out, which is what both Dan and I have built our careers around. Thank you. Um, some really interesting and thought provoking answers there, I think, and also I think uh, validating the importance of us as individuals and what we do, what we choose to do as individuals. Um, the, another question, uh, which is closer to home, um, what advice would you give to pupils at Haberdasher's schools um, about the sustainability of our own environment at school? Yeah, another really easy question. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, I mean, I've worked a lot with different organisations, different schools. So, for instance, I work with Festival Republic. So I've done kind of audits and uh, sustainability strategies for huge festivals like uh, 
wireless or latitude or um, places like that. So in a sense, it's a kind of like really understanding your problem. So we always start from the process of how we do it. We always start with like understanding the inputs. And so what kind of stuff is the school bringing in? What's your waste going out? You know, really understanding the kind of ecosystem of the school um, and then mapping that. And then from that, trying to work out where the ideas are, because I think the most important thing for you is about inspiring the people that you go to school with every day to change their behaviour. So if you see a bad behaviour, it's not about saying, don't put that in that bin, don't leave the lights on, don't do this, because actually it's about uh, sort of changing and inspiring and getting new habits in the way that you, the, the way that you live. So I would suggest that actually, a, so you know, doing some big pieces of work which actually take people on a journey about thinking about the inspiration. And if you think about the way that Dan works, it's about, um, what is possible, the art of the possible, we call it. And like, actually, we could live in amazing cities. We could have fantastic new green spaces. We could have clean air, but we just need to put some effort in and we just all need to change together and all need to be on the same kind of trajectory or the same journey. So I think it's very much about understanding what you're dealing with. So get the knowledge, get the information and then working out some really good campaigns on how to change the people around you and make them aware of it actually a lot of people that aren't even aware of the fact that they they have bad habits or so what i i quite like to do last a really quick one because i've got to go in a sec i'm afraid but the um i would love to work with the physics teacher and the geography teacher maybe and do a mapping exercise where you map your roof but also every child's roof in the school and you can use google maps really easily and you see, you have a look at what aspect they are. So which direction do they face? Do you have a big, good, clear roof? And to see whether you could put solar power on all of those roofs. And I think you should create a sort of collective to generate as much energy as you can and pester all your parents to put as, to, to generate as much energy as you can from solar energy, because in the end, that's the cleanest and the best. And it's really quite cost effective now. It'd be very easy to do. It'd be a really fascinating project. You could even kind of map actually the whole borough and, and begin to kind of work with the council and say, and you could do it very quickly. There's lots of great software. It's a lovely sort of project for kids to do to sort of show what would happen, what, what how much energy do you generate today? What happens if you cover all of that in solar? We know how much one solar panel generates. You could easily kind of look at how much solar you could generate, how much carbon you would sort of save. And you could then go forward and sort of say, not just marching, but actually, as Sophie was saying, in a really practical way, go to your borough and say, why don't we roll out a big solar project? This is how much this is how much we could generate. And actually, this is how much money it could make, because you can also put the figures to it. So I, I would say, take, get out there and do lots of interesting things, measure your rubbish, get into the bins, but also have a look at your roofs and see um, how much energy you could generate, both on in the school, in your community, and then in your own homes. I've got to, I'm going to have to head off in a sec, but um, it's been good fun. Um, thank you so much for that answer. You're lucky that Mr. Stock and I, you have the two <laughs> physics teachers here that will be, will be getting involved in this later. Um, all of Lower Five that are listening as well, they've been doing solar panels this year. It's part of what we've been doing, looking at the different energy mm. resources. And it's fantastic to hear how they're becoming up to date, because for us, a lot of the things that we see in the classroom say that the technology is not there yet to get them in the right place. So I am so pleased to hear from experts outside getting <laughs> that new knowledge that they are really, they're really coming in. And um, we've had some lovely questions come in from you. I'm really sorry we haven't got time to answer any more of them. But what we'll do is we will get back to you with the answers. Dan and Sophie have both said they're more than happy to look at these questions afterwards so we will get back to them and we'll get you some answers one way or another and thank you so much for that um we've had some truly inspiring insight into sustainability this morning one of the wonders this week is having inputs from experts outside of habs so could we give them a massive virtual round of applause <laughs> for their talks and taking the time out of their busy schedules to be part of the day i know dan is rushing off to an important meeting so we're very lucky to have had both of them this morning we have some wonderful activities for you today today for you to do today 
all linked to the theme of sustainability. Firstly, you're heading off to upcycle or repurpose an object in your home. Remember, you must upload any work from your camera roll if you're using your iPad and save your work as your name. I am so excited to dip into your house areas later to see what you've produced as part of that project. And there is a wonderful video from Mr Turner to help you along the way with that. The second activity is looking at how to solve a problem or create an initiative to make your local co local community that little bit more sustainable. And that might involve what Sophie said or Daniel said, I can't remember, delving into those bins and kind of seeing what's going on in that bit there. It might be something as small as a little campaign or it might be a grander idea like solar panels or sustainable food usage at home or in school. Look at the world around you for inspiration. There is no limit to your imagination. Read our brief carefully for guidance and again, upload from your camera roll or save and save your work as your name. In the afternoon, we have the pleasure of some of our truly talented staff leading the way with their take on sustainability and areas that they are passionate about. And I have loved dipping into those talks so far and I'm sure you will too. We are so excited to see what you're going to produce in sessions one and two and even more excited to be joined by a former head girl and an advocate for sustainability in our last session. She is helping our judging and will give us some inspiring words before we award our virtual prize winners. Fun and awesomeness. I hope to see you at the end of the day. Have a lovely time. Bye. Hi guys. And Bye. If anyone wants to go for a, if anyone wants to go for a walk in the Olympic Park after COVID, let us know and we'll do a, We'll organise a big walk. See you later. Fantastic. Bye. Thank you. Bye.